Good morning, church family. Good morning. I have, I think, just one announcement for you as we get started this morning. This is sort of a looking ahead announcement. At Monday's council meeting, we decided that the congregational vote, so a special congregational meeting in which you're going to decide whether or not to call me as your settled pastor, is going to happen on May 23rd. Your Penrith East Conference liaison, Larry, who has been working with you, and in particular with your search committee all throughout your process, will be on hand to help lead that meeting. He will provide the voting ballots, and at the end of it, you will have made a decision for the future of this congregation. I'm excited for all of you. I'm looking forward to the day. So May 23rd is a date to mark on your calendars. As always, I am available for questions, concerns, to talk anytime anyone wants. Just come find me. I don't bite, I promise, if anyone hasn't figured it out yet. And I do believe that is the only thing. I'm not going to announce that every week between now and May 23rd, but I will remind you again as it gets closer. Any pressing questions? Excellent. Any other news or announcements from the community that I have missed? Alright, then we will let the chimes welcome us into worship. you are and wherever you are on life's journey. So let us rise as we are able and we will join together in this morning's call to worship based on the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, so I shall not want my shepherd makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. Restores my soul and leads me in right paths for the divine name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for God is with me. God prepares a table for me amid my enemies anoints my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in God's house. You may be seated as we listen to our first <clears throat>
comforted by the imagery of God the shepherd caring for all our needs. Yet sometimes we question whether God lives up to the words. And so for our doubtfulness, we confess together in prayer. Holy One, while we are inspired by the psalmist's words, we confess that we are often skeptical of them as well. We have done many once, and our words are turbulent. We can't see the right path, and we are afraid of the dark valleys. We don't want to hide among our enemies. And anointing our head with oil seems like an empty gesture because the only thing overflowing in our cup is struggle. Forgive us, Lord, when we doubt of your dedication to us. Help us to have greater trust in you as our divine shepherd. That we may be confident in your promise of goodness and mercy all the days of our lives. Amen. And as we confess together, so we also take a moment for our own personal confessions in the silence. God's presence is unwavering and will accompany, accompany us through every terrifying valley. God's spirit is unshakable and will sit with us even in the presence of formidable foes. God's love is relentless, whatever our doubts, for all the days of our lives. And so we proclaim, Praise be to God. Thank you. 
understand. Friends, let's pray as we prepare to read our scriptures together. Shepherding Savior, as we read this morning, may we be reminded of how blessed we are to be part of your flock. Let these sacred words linger on our hearts and move us to care for all the members of your flock with the same compassion that you do. And the people say, This morning we continue our reading from 1 John. Remember that this is a letter intended to function in essence as a sermon read to the community aloud. Last week we read in the beginning of the third chapter the author's thoughts on how to live based on the limited revelation we have about God. This week we'll read the conclusion of that chapter in which the author reaches a passionate climax, arguing that to love each other is the ultimate way to follow God. We continue with chapter 3, verse 16. We know love by this that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love not in speech or word, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and God knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All those who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit he has given us. So ends our first reading. Our second comes from the Gospel of John, which we remember is written for the same community as our sermon letter. The Gospel passage gives us part of Jesus' words in response to the Pharisees after they've challenged one of his healing miracles. It casts the same love the author First John writes about in the imagery of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. We read from chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. 
So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Here end our readings for today. Let them inspire us to an Easter way of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So now you all are going to participate in a little mini scavenger hunt. Perhaps some of you have noticed this already if you're very sharp-eyed. So there are 12 paper sheep that are hidden in the pews. They're only in the pews that are accessible to sit in. And the sort of places you're going to want to look might be in the holders, in Bibles, in hymnals, that sort of place. So take a moment and look and see if you can find a paper sheet. Not quite every pew has one, but a lot of them do. So if you can't find one and you want to skip ahead a pew and look, or skip back a pew and look, go ahead. Just remember, in open up. Bibles to the front page, open up hymnals, look in your holders, see if we can find some paper sheep. You're all being little shepherds right now. If I had my phone, I would have played a Jeopardy game for you.
be all that fun with our mini scavenger hunt. Not that fun, just getting to talk to you. It's a little bit weird though, isn't it, that this imagery of the divine shepherd from the 23rd Psalm to the gospel parables and metaphors has remained such an enduringly popular way of depicting God. The 23rd Psalm has been printed on everything from prayer cards to throw pillows to plaques. It's been set to music dozens of different ways, bringing its ancient usage as song into the contemporary era. You'll find it referenced in movies and TV shows and novels as a go-to comfort passage for Christian characters, even though the Psalms belong to our Jewish kindred just as much as they do to us. The 23rd Psalm is probably one of the handful of scriptures that when someone names it, you can rattle off the first line or two by memory. You know instantly what someone's talking about when they mention the 23rd Psalm. And then there's the gospel imagery of Christ as shepherd. And this too comes up again and again in our hymns. You'd be hard pressed to find a church that doesn't have a depiction of painting or other artwork of Jesus as a shepherd. Yours, by the way, if you didn't know, are in the parlor that has a large painting which is complete with a quote from the very passage that we just read, and also in the nursery where a smaller plaque shows a white-robed Jesus in the midst of a flock. Feel free to go looking for that artwork later if you don't remember it. And what's weird about its endurance is not that it's a bad metaphor. It is, in fact, a very good metaphor wrapping God's nurture, protection, and devotion into one neat image. What's weird about its endurance is that in this day and age, we don't really know much about shepherds. Who here has any direct experience with shepherding? Anyone? Nope. Who here has ever learned anything about shepherding that wasn't connected to the Bible's version of it? No takers. While shepherds and sheep farmers surely still exist, the vast majority of us will never have anything to do with them. Shepherd isn't in our everyday vocabulary outside of this specific faith metaphor. And that's weird because metaphors thrive on their relation to the everyday. In most cases, metaphors work because they are so very familiar. When Jesus used shepherding as a metaphor, it was because it was part of his listeners' everyday, familiar world in a way that it no longer is for us. So does that mean we should find a new metaphor? I spent some time this week thinking about what the modern day version of the Good Shepherd might be. I first thought of professions where folks often go above and beyond the call of duty to show their devotion like Jesus does. 
perhaps the good teacher, spending extra unpaid hours to tutor struggling students and choosing their own money to supply their classroom with everything their students need to succeed. Or perhaps the good nurse, working long shifts, running between patients, trying to be a carer and comforter, and in this pandemic era, they only substitute when visitors are not permitted. Oh, but then I thought about the protection Jesus emphasizes in today's passage. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, so perhaps a modern day metaphor might be the good firefighter, rushing into danger with no goal other than to save lives, even at the risk of their own. Or maybe even the good doctor, but not the TV show, needing to both react to crisis situations and provide long-term solutions preserve the health of their patients. But, but then, then I thought about Jesus' insistence in this passage that the Good Shepherd is different from the hired hand because the sheep belong to him. So maybe an even better modern day metaphor would be the good small business owner, dedicated to the success of their restaurant or store or service because they have built it with their own hands, poured their own love into it. Or maybe the good artist, sharing themselves with the world through the things they create reflecting their passion and creativity in their art. Those are all pretty decent metaphors. They have relevance to our current society, they're familiar, they have qualities we can look up to. With every modern day metaphor I came up with, I was pleased at first. Each of them does strike some chord with the imagery of Christ as shepherd, the nurturing teacher, the protecting firefighter, the sacrificing small business owner. And then, the closer I looked at my new and improved metaphors for the Good Shepherd, I found that all of them fell a little bit flat. They embodied one or two of the elements I associate with the Good Shepherd, but never all of them. Business owners have a special love for what they have built, but at the end of the day, they are supporting themselves, not the sheep. Firefighters rescue others, but with far more tools to also protect themselves than a first century shepherd had against a prowling wolf. And teachers can nurture and be devoted to their students, but they also need to let them go in a way the shepherd never does. My modern day metaphors were all a little too real. So the experiment showed that one of the reasons the metaphor of the divine shepherd has endured so well is precisely because it's weird. 
because it doesn't have a connection to our daily lives. I don't know a thing about modern day shepherding. And what little I know of ancient shepherding comes from my scripture studies. And that makes it the perfect image to describe God. The divine shepherd metaphor continues to work so well in the modern day because it isn't quite like anything we know. The same way that God isn't quite like anything we know. We know love and devotion and protection and nurture. We can spot those in our modern day metaphors but God takes all of them to a level beyond anything we experience anywhere else. God is different. The metaphor of the Good Shepherd is also different. For us, it is tailor-made to show us who Christ is, without being muddied by everyday reality. Christ is the only reality behind the metaphor of the Good Shepherd. And that is what makes it so very enduring to us. Turns out, we don't need a modern day shepherd metaphor after all. We just need to let the metaphor of Christ the Good Shepherd pervade our modern day. One of my favorite, most inspiring uses of the Good Shepherd metaphor that I've seen in recent times is actually a comic-like drawing. There have been a few variations floating around social media and the internet, but the basic comic illustration is the same. It shows Jesus the Good Shepherd with a single sheep on his shoulders, facing a flock of a few more sheep, one of which has an angry expression and a speech bubble that reads, Hey, they weren't lost. We kicked them out. In a second speech bubble, Jesus, with the lone sheep around his shoulders, replies, I know, and I found them. It's a modern day illustration that captures Christ's goal as the Good Shepherd better than any portrait I've ever seen in a church. It captures the Good Shepherd's love. Love that throws aside humankind's conditions and boundaries Love that does not care how we divide ourselves into many flocks because we are all God's sheep. Love that dares us to do better, that calls us to the same challenge that the author of First John issued to the early Christians. Let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Let us love as the Good Shepherd loves. Let us love as the Good Shepherd loves. Amen.
church family, as we uh, prepare to pray together this morning, we will pray for Marge Phillips, who will be undergoing hip replacement surgery later this week. So we will pray for a smooth surgery and swift recovery, and also for her husband, husband Richard's recovery after his own brief hospital stay earlier this week. We will also pray as a community for the recovery of Bob Bengal, who is at home recovering from heart surgery. So prayers for recovery all around this week. And are there any other joys, concerns, prayer requests to share from the community? Let's pray. Loving Savior, we ask that you lead us, your flock, with all the tenderness of a good shepherd, that you draw us to yourself and teach us how to follow you truly loving as you love, instead of wandering into the thorny wilderness of hate. Rescue us from our own foolishness, and when we are safe in your fold, O oh God, hear the prayers with which we come before you. Prayers for the lost, for those who are struggling to know their worth and who are not ready to hear that they are loved. May Christ's light pierce their darkness. Prayers for the rejected, for those who have been told they are not worthy and not welcomed into the flock. May Christ's acceptance be their resting place. Prayers for the sick, for those hoping for swift recoveries and successful treatments. May Christ's healing surround them. Prayers for the searching, for those haunted by unanswered questions and driven by desperation to find answers, may Christ's depth of wisdom be their compass. And finally, prayers for the church, for we who strive to love not only in speech, but in action, and to strive to become one great flock. May Christ's call continue to guide us, even as we pray the way Christ taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, meditate on the ways you can put love into action, just like the Good Shepherd.
however and whenever they are given of every kind. Let us rise as we are able and we will dedicate them to God in prayer together. Pray with me. Loving God, bless these gifts and all the ways in which we give. May each of our gifts be a part of tending to the love, safety, belonging, and dignity you envision for the world. Amen. Amen. Oh. 